Bruchim Aboyim. We are now on the uh, seventh lecture in the uh, series of the Haggadah. And um, we finished off last week with the paragraph that began with uh, Blessed is he who keeps his promises to Israel, which ended with the words that the Jews went out after all their servitude with Berchush Gadol, with great wealth. The instructions that the Haggadah now tell us that the matzahs are covered and the cups are lifted. And we begin with the famous uh, verse uh, paragraph that says, And this has stood for our fathers and for us. And it talks about that uh, in every generation they try to destroy us. Now, the word uh, kos which is, uh, again, the, for cup, that we lift our cup. In Hebrew, the gematria has a numerical value of 86, which is the same gematria, the same numerical value as the word hateva, which is nature. That in life one must raise up one's cup, meaning one's natural existence, and dedicate it to a higher purpose. It's interesting that the name of God of creation, when it said in the beginning, uh, for the book of uh, Genesis of Bereshis, Bereshis bar Elohim, the God created in the beginning. The word Elohim stands for the God of uh, judgment, but also the God who created the world. So again, Elohim has a numerical value of 86. Both nature and God, the same numerical value with the word kos. So we lift up to a higher purpose, which is Elohim, to the God of creation, and cover up the bread, I mean, to overcome the materialistic allures of the natural world. And one can then harness nature for its spiritual purpose, based on the of Yitzchak, of Lubavitch. And everything in life has a spiritual purpose. It's our job to elevate those sparks in life. And that's what the whole idea of the Seder is, of going from the, the rock bottom and lifting things up. So again, so the paragraph begins with the word vehi. And this is what stood for our fathers and for us. And it connects to the words, Berchush Gadol, they left with good, great wealth. Now, Jewish survival is dependent upon four things that are alluded to by the four letters, Vav, He, Yud, and Aleph, of the word Vayihi. Vav has numerical value of six, alluding to the six orders of the Mishnah, which is the oral tradition. He, five, alludes to the five books of the Torah which is the written Torah. The Yud is ten, which alludes to the Ten Commandments. And the Aleph, one, there's only one, the one and only God. So within the word Vayihi, we have all of that. Now, why lift our cup of wine here? Because with Vayihi, with this, with this decree, our rabbis forbidding non-Jewish wine, that has stood for our fathers and us, meaning preventing us from destruction through assimilation. That really the idea of not having wine um, went back to idol worship, because the finest wines were used for idol worship. So that's why we did not, once a bottle of wine was open, we didn't drink it, because it could have been used for idolatrous purposes. But then the rabbis took this one step further. Again, there's no temples per se that are used today in that regard. But we call is the Yayan Nesak, this wine, became the wine to, to share with the Gentile, people that you party with, people that you drink wine with, you wind up marrying. So again, to put a barrier between the Jew and the non-Jew, and to hopefully not have assimilation. Also in the Tehillim, in Psalm 109, verse 15, states, For wine gladdens the heart of man. So we, we call a God's salvation with wine in hand, based on the Aruch HaShulchan, to celebrate the event. Also, Vihi, and this alludes to our uniqueness, and that we have not been lost among the nations with whom we reside. Nothing short of a miracle. The fact that there is a Jew in the world, after all these years, between the, the term of the Esau being Ochi, my brother, and Esau, a combatant, that they've tried to wipe us out on both levels, and yet somehow we still exist today. Uh, again, there's a famous story, I may have said it before, of Frederick the Great, who was a great uh, philosopher, and he was having a debate, as he often did, with the archbishop. 
And uh, as you can imagine, the, one of the things they would discuss is, can you prove there's a God in the world? And for every argument the Archbishop Bishop, Bishop gave to Frederick, he had a counter-argument. And finally, the Archbishop had nothing else. He says, the proof that there is a God in the world is that there is still a Jew in the world. And Frederick smiled and said, I accept that. And again, that becomes one of the keys. Uh, also, our salvation many times comes to our enemies. Moshe Rabbeinu grew up in the palace of Paro. Uh, Haman caused Vashti to die. He was one of the advisors to Ahasuerus in the story of Purim. And uh, it was, uh, that's how Esther became the queen. And through that, she was able to uh, save the nation by going to... Uh, by going to Ahasuerus and complaining again with a wine feast. that uh, That's where they were they invited to, again, the connection to wine. Also, we lift our cups to God for saving us from our present enemies. Now, it's interesting. The Belzer Rebbe, uh, con con says concerning the Gemara in Yuma, that states when someone will stand before the heavenly court after his life, and they will ask him, why did you not study Torah? And if he answers because he was too poor, they will say to him, were you poorer than Hillel? Um, Hillel was so poor he made two coins that he earned every day being a wood chopper. One he would pay to, to get entry into the study hall. The other he would use for his food. A story, famous story told of one day he didn't have the two coins. So he climbed up on the roof and listened through the skylight. And it snowed that day. And he just about froze up there. Um, if he replies that he was too rich, the Gemara says they will ask him if he was richer than Relazer ben Kharsam. Again, he was fabulously wish, rich and had ships that sailed the sea. If he says he was too powerful or handsome, they will ask him if he was more powerful or more handsome than Yosef, Yosef the Tzaddik. So the letter, so in the word he, he, yud, aleph, stand for these three individuals. He is Hillel, the Yud is Yosef, and the Aleph, Eliezer. So again, a person has no excuse as to why he cannot serve God at a very elevated level. And it says, Not only one has stood up against us to destroy us, that we can overcome all enemies as long as God has not forsaken us, as long as Shlo Echad, as long as the one and only God, as long as God's not against us, we can survive. It's when God goes against us, that's where our troubles have come from. When we've driven God away, and that's how our temples have been destroyed. And because if God becomes our enemy, there's no, there's nothing we can do. We will lose. And this is when your children will ask you. And it says, El Shabakal Dor Vador, that in every generation, Om Dimaleinu Chalaseinu, they stand against us to destroy us. It's God who saves us from their hands. Now, what does it mean? Through their hands, miyodam, is extra. It could just say it's God who saves us. What does it mean, miyodam, from their hands? That our enemies become the hand that assists in our salvation. Again, Paro's daughter, who reached out her hand to bring in Moshe Benu's cradle when it was in the, the, the Nile. In fact, we call that the Yod, yod Chazaka that it was able to stretch out, some say 50 feet, some, some amazing amount. And again, we also learned a person should always make an attempt. You never know. There are stories of women who have lifted cars off of children, that uh, a person's capabilities is beyond his own reason and logic. Things happen. Also that um, Haman, who again, we mentioned, gave the advice to kill uh, Vashti, that when the Jews came back to Bubble, from Bubble to build the second temple, Ezra would not take the money of the Jews in Bubble. He wanted them to come back. He only came back with 40,000 Jews. And what he built the temple with is all that goes around comes around, poetic justice. When Haman was killed by Ahasuerus, he gave his, well, you may need the story of Purim, that um, Haman offered Ahasuerus 10,000 talents of silver, a fortune, to kill out the Jews, since he would be losing the money of their taxation. Nachash who was even a greater anti-Semite than Haman, told him to keep it. And when Haman, when Haman was hung by Nachash 
But Akashverosh, the king, did as he gave Esther Haman's estate. And Esther gave it to Mordechai. And Mordechai gave that money to Ezra. The second temple was built with the same money that Haman wanted to use to destroy the Jewish nation. Again, all that goes around comes around. And it continues. And it says that the, uh, the word galut of the exile is derived from the word goli, revelations. That under the conditions of exile, the innermost self becomes revealed. Also, one's inner strength. The person does not know what he can accomplish. It's very important. We really baby ourselves. Based on the Sfasemis, that's why we were putting that Kur Barzel and that crucible in Egypt to become hard as steel, and that's who we are. We've managed to um, overcome everything and anything that the world has thrown at us. Now, continues with the, the paragraph Selamad. Selamad, it says again, go and learn. Some say, come and listen. Lovin, the Aramean, attempted to do to our father Jacob. Parv decreed only against the males, but Lovin attempted to uproot everything. Uh, Shinamar, as it says. So what does it mean, say, Lamad, go and learn, that by studying the Torah, we learn all that we have to, to do. Uh, we have to learn about dealing with evil people and life. Also, go and teach. Go and teach our children that just as God saved Yaakov, from all of Lovin's machinations, all of his schemes, so too that God will continue to save us from our enemies, many times without our knowledge, without knowing exactly, but God is always there based on Aruch HaShulchan. Also is connected to the previous verse where we lift the cup of wine, again, that we should not socialize with the Gentile nations because, again, it will hurt us. We should learn from the past. And also one should leave home. It's interesting that when a young man becomes 13, we still have a tradition today, they'll go away to a Hebrew school, what we call the yeshiva, to learn. Again, go to, go to yeshiva to learn. Again, also make someone mature, being away from home and not being babied. Also that one must transcend the limitations of self, and that one can truly acquire knowledge based on a Rebbe. Again, uh, person, the greatest battle we have in life is against ourselves, going against who and what we are. Continues with the words again, what is Lovan? Ma bikesh Lovan Rami Lasa. What did he attempt to do to Yaakov, our father? Now, it's an interesting question. Why does the Torah focus on Lovan and Egypt, Mitzrayim? Why not Esav or Amalek? They also tried to kill us. Uh, so it says at least Esav had a legitimate complaint against Yaakov. After all, Yaakov had taken his birthright and then his blessings. And both Lovin and Mitzrayim, although on the other hand, benefited from the nation of Israel and Yaakov and still tried to destroy his based morale, a lack of gratitude. And what Judaism is about, Yehuda, to praise God, to say thank you. Again, totally against Torah values. And it says that Paro only decreed against the males. Again, the women, there was never, never a decree to kill the Jewish, the Jewish uh, female babies. But love and bikesh lakers a call. He sought to destroy the whole thing, everything. How how was how was it? Was he? How did he try to destroy everything? It says when Eliezer that when uh, after Abravino came back from the Akeda from bringing Yitzchak as a sacrifice to God, that he decided it was time for Yitzchak to get married. Being already a older person, he was about 140 at the time. Um, Yitzchak was 40 when he got married. So he sent his trusted servant, Eliezer, back to the house of Lovin and Pesuel to find a wife for Yaakov. When Eliezer came, Lovin tried to poison him. And the Medra says that an angel switched the plates that was given to Eliezer. And Pesuel, Lovin's father, died because he ate the food that was meant for Eliezer. Now, there's an interesting law in the Gemara and Gittin it says if someone sends a messenger to marry a woman, not real romantic, but it's, it's possible, and the messenger dies before he returns, the sender is forbidden from marrying any woman, since he may be married to her relatives. And that would be a prohibition of Torah. So since he's not sure who, who the messenger married, he cannot marry anyone. So if Laban had succeeded in trying to kill Eliezer, Yitzchak would not have been able to ever get married again, which would have put an end to the Jewish nation. 
Also, Lavan and Bilam, according to many Midrashim, were the same person. And it was Bilam who advised Paro to drown the infants in the Nile and also to try to curse them and brought the plagues on them and sheet them at the end of the 40 years in the desert. And it says, Arami Oved Avi, that the Arimian destroyed my father. Beir and Mitzrayim, and they went down to Mitzrayim. Beir Goshem, and they dwelt from Seimaot, few in number. But he Shem, and they were there for a great nation, and they became great, and mighty, and numerous. And all of the and, and uh, again, so the question becomes: What does it mean, Arami Oved Avi? Which is uh, present tense. So what does that mean? Then we went down to Mitzrayim. So it says that we had to go into this core barzel, this iron smelting pot of Egypt, because of our connection to Lavan. Uh, all of the mothers of Israel were the daughters of Lavan, all four of them. And this is alluded to by the word barzel, which means iron, steel. That the four daughters' names were Billa, the bays of, of the word barzel, Resh, second letter, is Rachel, Zion, Zilpa, and Lamed, Leah. Again, allude to these, these uh, four daughters. Also, he didn't really not destroy them, but he tried to. And we know a thought for a non-Jew is like a deed, so therefore it was as if he did it. Also, again, the Prophet was a Pacham Sefer. Also, by fooling Yaakov with Leah, when he really wanted to marry Rachel, and he switched his daughters. Yosef had Yaakov and married Rachel first, or only Yaakov, because he was not looking to really marry four women. Yosef, Yosef then would have been the firstborn uh, and would not have been sold to Egypt, which caused the whole exile. Again, had he been the firstborn, the brothers may not have been jealous at him. He would have been the firstborn. They would have owed him that respect. They thought that the whole thing was, again, that he was taking everything for himself. Also, it's uh, present tense. That it should have been past tense. The answer is because it's an ongoing and constant, even today, of the Arami Ovidavi of people trying to destroy us has not stopped all through history. And um, it's interesting, why is he called Lovin? Lovin means white. So you would think that'd be the last thing that this evil person would be called. The answer is because until his time, everyone knew that sin is black and dirty. But he was a Ramai. Again, Arami He was a Ramai, which means he was a cheat. He was slick and was able to dress it up in the guise of white and clean, which is why he p posed the greatest danger based on the Alcantov on a, a medrash in Elias Haggadah. And it says, the year in Mitzrayim where they went down to Egypt. What does that mean? On the Sapia Dibur, they were compelled to because of the decree of Gaiat, the defined decree. But the uh, Piha Dibur also mean because of the speech. Dibur was the speech, the speech because of the Lush and Hara, the evil gossip that Yosef spoke about his brothers um, based on a shock. So that's one thing, as one of the reasons why Yosef had to go to Egypt and why we followed afterwards. Also, the, the word Avram Avinu said to God at the covenant between the parts, the Brisbane Absarim, when he said, Bama Eda, how will I know? Bama. And because of that word, again, we had to go down to Mitzrayim because of the decree of God. It says that they, they, they dwelt there, that we know that Yaakovino did not go down to reside in Egypt, only to stay there temporarily, as it says. Because they said to Paro, we've only come to sojourn in the land. Why? There's no pasture land for, our, for, your, for, for your, your servants. It says... So why are they do, why why are they telling Paro this? And the answer is that the famine was so great in in the land of Israel when they went down or Canaan as it was called at the time that people were eating the grass that was usually set aside for sheep, and therefore that's why they had to come. God forced them to to go down to Egypt uh, again, as they said, because the famine is very great. Uh, and then, and then our, your servants will dwell by Eretz Goshen in the land of Goshen. The reason why the land of Goshen, because we know that when uh, Abram Avinu uh, first went down to Egypt with Sarah during his famine, that 
uh, Sarah, Sarah was abducted, taken into the harem of Paro. Paro was punished for that. And to bribe her for her goodwill, one of the things he gave her was the land of Goshen. So actually the Jews came back to take what was their grandmother's in the first place. And it says, B'msei ma'at, few in number. That, as it says, B'shiv nefesh, with 70 soul, your do of a that are your, are your forefathers went down to Egypt. And now you see the God has made you kakok v'yashmayim l'rav, like the stars of the heaven for the multitude. Now, it's interesting, it says b'shivim nefesh, with 70 soul. It should say b'shivim nefeshot, 70 souls, plural. Nefesh is singular. So the source of the strength of Israel, which helped them endure the Egyptian exile, was the fact that they were nefesh, united, as one amongst themselves, all worshiping, again, the one and only God, based on the Urat of Now, this is the strength of any nation. Where there is unity, there is strength. And where there is uh, dissension, again, then no one survives. And it says that they were like the stars of the, sky, of the heaven for, uh, in multitude. Now, from Earth, it's interesting that the stars look very small. Yet they are, in reality, larger than the Earth that we walk upon. And so to the nation of Israel. In this world, they may seem small in importance, but in heaven, they have very great significance. In fact, it says that in time of the, after the coming of the revival of the dead, that the angels will go to the Jews and ask, where is God? To show you how great the nation is. Also, by the light of the stars, one has the ability to navigate the dark night, that a, that a sailor on the open waters of the sea where everything looks the same. As long as he can see the stars, he knows exactly where he's at and how to navigate. And so to each and every Jew has a spiritual light within him to influence friends and family, to bring them out of the darkness into the spiritual light of God. And it says that he showed Shem the Goy Godel, and they were there for a great nation. So Malamit teaches Yeshom Mutsuyonim Shem that the Jews were distinctive there. Now, the rabbis tell us that the nation of Israel redeemed for three uh, acts that they performed while they were slaves in Egypt. Three merits. Actually, there's a fourth also we'll talk about in a second, but the basic were they did not change their dress, they did not change their names, and they did not change their language, which is strange. That means everybody walked around with a long black coat and side locks and a furry hat, and uh, everybody's name was Chaim, and... Uh, Everybody spoke Ivrit, which, of course, is no way. So, no, they all dressed in Egyptian clothes. They spoke Egyptian, and they had Egyptian names. So what does that mean? And the answer is that, yeah, they may have dressed as Egyptians, but just like today, a person can dress in, in modern clothing, but with modesty, and that they did. And even though they had names that may have been Egyptian, they were not names of idols. And even though they may have spoken Egyptian, they spoke properly. They weren't vulgar and they weren't crude. And this is the merits. So fourth merit they talk about also that of not speaking Lush and Hara. Even though Moshe Rabbeinu, when he had a run for his life after killing the Egyptian, um, it was Dustin and Avira that spoke Lush and Hara about him to Paro. That's why he had a run for his life, because they spoke Lush and Hara. And Moshe said, now I understand why they're incarcerated. But the truth of the matter is, the reason why the Torah mentioned this was the only case the Jews did not speak about themselves. They did not speak gossip. Now, so this becomes, again, the great strength. And for this, they were able to be redeemed. And it says they were God of the Atzum. They were great and mighty. That even though the Jewish women gave birth to six tuplets, that this was the miracle in order for them to reach the number. So we know four-fifths of the Jews died during the plague. So it may well, during the last day, you know, during the uh, days of darkness, the ninth plague. Um, I have a, you know, someone who's a, a, a professor of statistics, and he says that in, the, in that time they well could have had, with having six tuplets, a number of 15 million people, going starting off with 70. So it is within the realm of reality that this could have happened. Because we know they left with 600,000 men between the ages of 20 to 60. But again, there were women, 
and there are also people under the age of 20 and those over the age of 60. So we can figure somewhere between the two to three million that left, which would have been four-fifths, one-fifth, somewhere between 12 to 15 million that would have been in Egypt. And um, where do we see this from? It says, of Bnei Yisrael and the children of Israel, Paru, that they uh, were fruitful, and they, they were, they were, they, uh, were, were multiplied, and they were many, and they were great, Ma'od, Ma'od, six terms. And these six terms allude again to the six tablets they had. Then it said, and the earth was filled with them. Now, what do you mean filled with them? That they had outgrown Goshen, and now they had to live in Egypt proper among the Egyptians. And it makes sense, because initially they only lived in Goshen. That was the Jewish section. But they became so great in number, Yosef could not have imagined them growing in such, in such numbers as far as the population. So he turned Goshen into a slum, and the Jews had to pour out into Egypt proper. And this is why the word Pesach, skipping over, because otherwise God would not have skipped over the houses of the Jews to kill the Egyptian firstborn, which seems to testify to the fact that they lived among the Egyptians. And uh, again, so that they, this is again for the terminology of the word Pesach. Now also that the women of Timale or some that the earth was filled with them, that the women went out to the apple orchards to give birth to their children, and the Egyptians were taking their children and th throwing them, male children, into the Nile, killing them. So what the women did is they went out to the apple orchards where they had seduced their husbands and then came back to give birth to their children quietly. Some say that's why the plague of the frogs, that croak and make a lot of noise, that they had to be very quiet when they gave birth. And then they would leave the young children in the orchards and miraculously the angels would take them and burrow them into the ground like animals, and then the angels would take care of them. But Timale or someone, the earth was filled with them, means that they were in the earth itself until they grew, and then they go back to their parents. And there's an allusion to this in the Oz Yashir, famous uh, song that they sang when they crossed the sea and came out on the other side. When they said, Zach Kaley be unveiled, Zach means this, pointing with a finger, that these children told their parents, the revelation that they saw when they crossed the sea was greater than that when Yecheskel saw when they went up to heaven in a fiery chariot. And they said, this is what we grew up with. This is what we saw. So again, with Himali or so some, the land was filled with them. Also, the rabbi tells the Jews crowded into the theaters and other public places of entertainment, thereby further feeding the hatred of their hosts, of the Egyptians. It should be noted that the Levites who kept to themselves and did not mingle escaped the enslavement which became the fate of their brethren based on Elias Haggadah, which is the same today. The Jews are found everywhere, from politics to sports arenas, that we want to be part of the whole thing. You know, that when the country clubs said the Jews weren't allowed, Jews and dogs, you know, we didn't know why the dogs were elevated, because a religious Jew has, that's not really interested in whether he's going to a country club or not. So again, the fact that if they were separated would have helped them. It says, Virav kam tzemach hasada, and they grew like the sprouting of the, in the fields. Why the comparison to plants growing in the field? Just like a plant, the more you prune them, the more they grow. So to the nation of Israel, the more they were oppressed, the more their numbers grew based on Abudraham. And it says, they fatiri, fatigli, again, they grew and they came. They gave a top, ate adayim, nachonah, v'shev kateh meach. Va'at erum v'eria, it says, and you were naked and you were bare. Now, naked and bare mitzvahs, whose merit they would need to be redeemed. That's what the nakedness was about. And it says, I passed by you, v'era, v'bosas, 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 and I saw you in the downtroddenness in your blood, and it says, Omerloch, and I told you, but the but the Mayachai. Now, the downtrodden in your blood, these two mitzvahs are fundamental. One in the realm of Asetov doing good, and the other in the realm of Sumira, turning away from evil. That circumcision is a fundamental do good mitzvah through which we establish a covenant with God. Taking the Korban Pesach, the Paschal off of it, was a final act of Sur Mirav, turning away from evil, since by slaughtering the lamb, the nation of Israel rejected the God of the Egyptians, the sign of Ares. So the idol worship in which they had become so immersed, they now turned against. 
by performing these two mitzvahs of the Paschal offering of going against the God of the Egyptians and circumcision, they could experience not just a physical liberation, but an internal transformation and redemption at the same time. Now, it's interesting that the Paschal offering and circumcision are the only two cases in the entire Torah where an intentional failure to perform a positive commandment carries the punishment of excision. And the question is why? Why only these? Because it was in the merit of these two commandments, circumcision and the Paschal offering, that the nation were freed and became connected to God forever. Therefore, anyone who intentionally ignores these commandments is cut off from his people, both from life and from his nation, as if he had never left Egypt, based on B'nai Yisachar. And when it talks about, again, with B'nai Chayi, uh, by the Maya Chayib with your blood, two terms said at, the, at his circumcision. These are two acts of serious nefesh, of putting your life on the line, that gave the nation of Israel the merit to be redeemed from Egypt, where they had no merit. And both involved blood, the blood of the Paschal offering and the blood of circumcision. And both bloods were put on their doorposts, not just the blood of the Paschal offering. Again, that's why we say these words at a circumcision, because even today they stand in our stead. And I think what we'll do is we'll stop here. And next week we'll continue with Fayyir Osanu and Mitzrayim and the, and the Egyptians did evil to us. Again, thank you for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbos.